Um, thank you for the great introduction, and thanks to everyone for coming out today on this rainy day. Um, I'm just going to do a very brief introduction of, of Penn and then the, the panel discussion that we have in the reading. Um, for, for any of you who don't know, uh, Penn America is uh, the largest and most active branch of international Penn. It has 144 centers around the world, and it was founded on the notion that art and literature and ideas could transcend and supersede uh, national borders and, uh, and hatreds that came out of World War I and kind of unite and bring people together uh, for a global exchange of ideas in ways that you can't through governments. It's, uh, it's one of those things that's been carried over for over 90 years. It was founded in 1922, and it carries over into our mission. Um, we have a World Voices Festival that is also an iteration of that idea that, that um, art and literature can transcend and bring people together. Uh, today's panel kind of works off that notion. So one of the things that we wanted to do uh, with place and displacement was to think about where we are uh, in contemporary culture today, especially in a political cycle that um, has had some, some uh, conversations about how we need to uh, quarantine or build walls and, and divide ourselves a little bit more. In an age of uh, intense information proliferation and globalization, where uh, global travel has facilitated a, a more porous border, I wanted to see uh, where identity rests and what American values are and what America means, not just uh, in the United States, but the Americas, that's south of the border, it's everything that, that would encompass the Americas, but not do it uh, through a way that would, um, that would allow other people to define what America's, what the Americas are, what our identity is, but ha have uh, that go through the narratives of writers, um, the narratives of, of people who live in various places who are born uh, in Mexico or in the United States uh, and who have found their identity in other areas. So writers who kind of transcend the borders um, and have, de have redefined what it is to be a contemporary uh, global writer. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce uh, the writers who we have this year on the panel. Um, uh, after I do an introduction, the writers will, uh, will join me on the stage, and then we'll do a reading. Each one will read for a couple of minutes, and then we'll have a, an open discussion on place and displacement. So uh, Francisco Goldman uh, is, uh, has published four novels, one book of nonfiction. His most recent novel is Say Her Name, which won the 2011 Prix Femina uh, Etranger. Uh, the Long Night of White Chickens was awarded the American Academy's Sue Hoffman Prize for Fiction. His novels have been finalists for several prizes, including the Penn Faulkner, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, The Ordinary Seaman, and uh, The Ordinary Seaman was a finalist for the International Impact Dublin Award. Um, and his most recent book, uh, The Interior Circuit, was named by the LA Times as one of the top 10 books of this year. He's an amazing writer, and we're very happy to have him. Uh, Veronica Gonzalez Pena was born in Mexico City uh, and raised in Ohio and California. In 2003, she founded Rocky Point Press, a series of artists and writers collaborative, uh, a series of artist and writer collaborative, print books, prints, books, and films, uh, and her 2008 novel, Twin Time, uh, or How Death Befell Me, it was awarded the Atslan Literary Prize for Best Novel. Her second novel, The Sad Passions, has been called lyrically, emo lyrical, emotionally moving, and stylistically innovative. Um, Emmanuel, Emmanuel uh, Xavier is an LGBT History Month Icon, his author of the poetry, he's the author of Poetry Collections Radiance, which is the most recent, Nefarious, American, Americano, Growing Up Gay and Latino in the USA, Peer Queen, If Jesus Were Gay and Other Poems, and the novel Christ Like. Um, his often narrative poetry, his often uh, narrative poetry features political, sexual, and religious themes, which continue to inspire new generations of confessional poetry. Um, he's one of the uh, first openly gay New Yorican poets, and he's been a longtime gay rights activist, uh, AIDS activist, and homeless youth advocate. Um, I'm going to start off the, the reading with uh, Emmanuel, who's going to come up uh, after everyone joins us on the stage, and I'm going to ask Francisco, Veronica, and Emmanuel to come up, and we'll take our seats. Hello. Um, this first poem is from my latest book, Radiance. And um, before Beyonce had Becky, I had Becca. And this poem is called Becca. <laughs> when people talk about comfort foods, 
remembering childhood and family, I often find myself trying to sell the idea of arroz con huevos. I somehow survive malnutrition with white rice, two fried eggs, and just some salt. In school, the rich kids would brag about meatloaf, mac and cheese, lasagna, tater tots. I stayed silent and kept drawing, hoping the teacher would skip me again. I didn't know I was poor until I told Becca what my favorite dish was, and she shared this with the other mean girls I used to think were so cool. I wasn't even worthy of gay sidekick status anymore because I was an unfashionable accessory, a poverty-stricken fag. We all know he likes huevos, but with white rice? My mom didn't get to stay home and bake cookies all day. She had to work at the factory and come home tired to put some dinner together. And yeah, this makes me crave a familial embrace and sleeping in Hulk underoos. So fuck you, Becca. Just have a couple more poems. Um, this poem um, I read recently on a trip to Puerto Rico, which is very symbolic for me um, because I actually never met my father, who is Puerto Rican. It's called Rhetoric of Empire. I imagine him a heartbreaker like I grew up to be, perhaps with dark eyes and tattoos and a nefarious persona. It is said he was Puerto Rican. In the 70s, getting an Ecuadorian immigrant pregnant was perhaps Boricua blasphemy. The local Hibaras would not be having it. I've never heard from or seen or met my father. Fact is, there is nothing to prove this otherness. Still, I see him when I stare at myself hard enough in the mirror, when people ask where my freckles came from, when I am naked, being devoured by another man. I picture him sitting somewhere on the island in his guayabera with a small golden crucifix glistening against the hairy chest I didn't inherit. He is probably mustached, smoking cigarettes, waiting for his wife to make him dinner. I wonder if he thinks of me as he watches the sunset below the horizon, a daily reminder of the sun he left behind. Maybe he owns a guinea pig, a pet symbol of his experiment, the nickname given to me, El Cui, as an outcast child. I am certain he has grown children, a hundred percent Taino, untainted with Inca blood. They will claim his empire as I continue to write bastard poems hoping to be remembered. I would have atoned for him like the mother who cast me out as her demon spawn and the stepfather that never welcomed me as his own. I often dreamt of walking on a dirt road with a suitcase and a couple of dollars heading toward the vanishing tropical sun hoping to find a shadow of his smile. Instead, I have traveled from men to men unattainable in this journey to forgive myself for being born creating chaos. He does not know that I suffer from OCD or find humor in pathological doubt and self-destruction. He's oblivious to my being neglected by my own cultures because my Spanish has a different access, clueless to these combined features which don't make me look one or the other but often confused from Mexican instead. Inevitably, I would have been abandoned once he found out I was also gay. There are no faded photographs, recorded phone conversations, birthday videos, or online searches to link this history. The truth is tucked away in our hearts, underneath our pillows, in dreams, and letters never sent. In his absence, I have conquered my own kingdom. It is in the beauty of the stars in the night sky, the sounds of the ocean, the sweet taste of mangoes, the smell of coffee, that we share this life as one. Um, so I live in Bushwick in Brooklyn, and um, it's changed dramatically, and I felt I had to write this poem. It's called Gentrification. This is the dust of dreams that once prevailed, displayed bohemian memories erased for the sake of high value, us who created something from nothing to make it appealing for those who own everything. We who were poor before it was trendy to sport the look of struggle, the three-story building in which I chose to stay is now gutted, leaving me to fight from the top of a treehouse with nothing below. A siege of hipsters await outside armed with PBR cans and artisanal mail, 
While our people are scattered throughout dangerous lands they do not know. Once homeless, the guerrilla tactics of moral disintegration remain futile toward me. Even then I battled for my house, dance floor similarly held by beams and joists. I remain in this ghost town with my ancestors, watching hipsters skateboard down the street in grandpa's clothes, unaware they soon will be the disenfranchised and undesirable. This is the sound of the world changing. And my last poem, Americano. I look at myself in the mirror trying to figure out what makes me an American. I see Ecuador and Puerto Rico. I see brujo spirits moving across the backs of santeros, splattered with the red blood of sacrificed chickens on their virgin white clothes, and blue beads for Yemaya, practicing religions without a roof. I see my own blood running the white sheets of a stranger, proud American blue jean labels on the side of the bed. I see Don Rosario and his guayabera sitting outside the bodega with his Puerto Rican flag reading time in the eyes of alley cats. I see my mother trying to be more like Marilyn Monroe than Julia de Burgos. I see myself trying to be more like James Dean than Federico Garcia Lorca. I see Carlos Santana, Gloria Stefan, Ricky Martin, and Jennifer Lopez more than just sporadic Latin explosions, more like fireworks on El Cuatro de Julio, as American as Bruce Springsteen, Janis Joplin, Elvis Presley, and Aretha Franklin. I see Taco Bells and chicken fajitas at McDonald's. I see red, purple, blue, green, yellow. I see Cheetah Rivera on Broadway. You see, I am as American as lemon merengue pie. As American as Wonder Woman's panties, as American as Madonna's bra, as American as the Quinteñeros, the Abduls, the Lees, the Jacksons, the Kennedys, all of us immigrants to the soil, since none sound American Indian to me. As American as television snow after the anthem is played, and I am not ashamed. Jose, can you see? I pledge allegiance, allegiance to this country, tis of me, land of dreams and opportunity, land of proud detergent names and commercialism, land of corporations. If I can win gold medals at the Olympics, if I can sign my life away to die for the United States, ain't no small town hick or Donald Trump gonna tell me I'm an American because I can speak in two languages. Coño carajo, I fuck you. <laughs> This is my country, too, where those who do not believe in freedom and diversity are the ones who need to get the hell out. Thank you. OK, I guess there's going to be a little change in tone here. I can't do, I can't do that. Um, so uh, as I was preparing for this talk, um, is that OK? Am I too close? It struck me that what might be most effective was if I read a bit of the beginning of my last novel to you. The novel, The Sad Passions, is loosely autobiographical. I, like most writers I know, take from everywhere in order to make a compelling story. My own life, others' lives, bits of things I've read or heard, dreams, pure imagination. I mine it all and combine and poeticize to create something new. The Sad Passions is told in five first-person narrations, four sisters and their mad mother, Claudia. My own mother is manic depressive, and for this book I had to inhabit a voice close to what I imagined my mother's internal voice might be. I didn't grow up with her, and this invocation was exhausting. It seemed important to share this story here, as my mother's madness, which, because it was Mexico City in the 60s, was never diagnosed, has written my whole life. It is why I came to the United States. It is the reason I became an immigrant. It seemed important to share this story here because, as we all now acknowledge, the personal is the political. 
There was a time when people spoke of the personal, especially in art making, as being self-indulgent, as being apolitical. But I think it's become clear to most of us now that the personal is the political. Each story matters. The voicing of those stories matters. And this is why I decided to share the fictionalized version of how I came to the United States. My story, poeticized through the character of Julia. The facts of a life, when abstracted, are mere facts. They lie flat. But when effectively told, the story moves us and stays with us and creates a porous empathy and a deep sympathetic understanding can exist. The story becomes a part of us and a kind of collaborative position unfolds. It underlines and anchors our joint humanity in ways we don't really fully understand. And because in my novel, I tell the story of my life in as compelling a way as I know how, and though it is both fact and fiction always at the same time, I thought this is what I should share with you here. As mentioned, the book is told in five voices. Sandra is the youngest of Claudia's daughters. Because she is quite a bit younger than the others, she has a perspective the others don't and can tell their story through the widest angle lens. And so the book opens with her. This is the amended version of that beginning. So each of the chapters in the novel um, has the title of the characters named, so that way it's easier for the reader to kind of keep these five first person narrations clear in their minds. And this is Sandra. I was born the year Julia was given away. And though nobody knew it at the time, I was there when it happened. Because, as I figure it, our mother, Claudia, was three months pregnant with me when that severance occurred. It didn't help that of all my sisters, I was the only one who looked like Julia. Julia was not yet seven when she was sent away from our family home in Mexico City to live with our uncle David in the United States. A big black car came for her on that fateful morning, my frostily distant paternal grandmother, its single sinister passenger. It would be only hours later after the solemn midday meal that my grandmother, Marina, would take Julia from us, on that day staining, staining us all forever. Rocio, the oldest of the four of us, tells of how they all stood in an uneasy grouping, feet shuffling, watching with confused and wary eyes as my terrified, terrified sister was led away, her painfully hesitant steps. Rocio says Julia turned one last time, getting on her knees to stare out the back window. Her little beseeching hand rose up slowly, and she waved back and forth like a wipe, her sad and searching brown eyes a straight line, firmly set upon Rocio's, so that Rocio had to tear her own eyes away, tears running down her face. My sisters and my mother with me in her belly had only been back from the desert for a few months, had seemed to just be settling in when Julia was taken away. My mother and three sisters had arrived in my maternal grandmother Cecilia's home defeated, scared and unnerved. My uncle Felix had been sent to fetch them. He'd spent a whole dutiful night driving the vastness of that northern Mexican landscape and had reached them at dawn, mere minutes after passing the lagoons, the sun just rising on the distant horizon. The desert floor was covered in long-legged spiders when he arrived that early morning. They'd hatched the previous night after the first long rain of spring, and now they were charging for safety in ranks, blanketing the ground that vast rush of an arachnid army. They marched across his leather city shoes as he stepped out of the car with divine indifference to his presence there, and for a while he watched that sacred march as they moved from east to west as if on special order. And then he walked, with halting steps at first, crunching whole troops of them as he made his way to the house which stood small and desolate in that big desert landscape. Inside, it was a hostile mess, and she, in the midst of it, filthy, sitting in a corner, staring at the wall, her long hair tangled, her head turning sharply, eyes going from blank to fierce as he walked through that weighty threshold. What are you doing here? Claudia gasped. Come on, he said, I'm taking you and your girls back to the city. It had happened in steps, but Rocio, who was nine, had finally found it inside herself to call my grandmother Cecilia, and immediately my grandmother had sent her son Felix to fetch them. 
My uncle Felix, who had no job to speak of, did it for a small fee. The money folded neatly in his pocket like a filial bounty hunter he had gone to collect his sister, to bring her and her three daughters home to his mother. He gathered those girls, though he fastidiously held them at arm's length as they rushed to hug him, a single unruly mass, insisted they bathe before he'd allow them into his car. Clean, they were permitted to jump in, without any of their things, however, I'm not taking that junk, he said dryly, wiping at the desert dust left on his shoes. Leave it here. He made them leave the cat, too, though Rocio and Julia cried out at the injustice. Then, the whole ride home, my mother wept in the front seat. I don't want to, she repeated again and again. I don't want to. And no one dared ask what it was she didn't want to do. To Rocio, it had become clear slowly, but then one night Claudia forced them to sit in a bath for hours on end. She never made them bathe at all, so this was strange. Their bodies grew cold and shriveled in that late night water, and so they began calling to where she sat in the other room, begging our mother to let them get out. I don't care, little Marta said when Claudia didn't answer. I want to get out. Not until she tells us it's okay, Rocio warned. But Marta shoved Rocio away and jumped out, her round bottom dripping all over the floor. Rocio panicked, but when nothing terrible happened, she got out too, her long, thin limbs. Should we go to bed now? Should we go to bed? Rocio, her hair still wet, asked our mother, who sat staring into blankness in the bedroom. I don't care, Claudia answered, hollow. And then the next day she was gone, locking the door behind herself. Claudia locked the door behind herself, locked them in from the outside, and then did not come back for nearly a week. Rocio had had to find scraps with which to make simple soups to feed my sisters. She had fried eggs. And then the three of them would climb out the window and run around all day as if there were nothing strange in this, as if it were normal to be locked in your house by your mother. They'd simply climb out the window and spend the day, as always, running and playing in the garden, eating prickly pears and desert plums from the neighbor's trees. At night, they'd crawl back in the window, never mentioning our mother at all. When she finally returned, Claudia moved from ordering them around with erratic, screeched commands to completely ignoring them. She would cry and cry all day. She made no sense at all. Her dark eyes were fierce, and her long black hair, uncombed, looked fuller than ever. Our mother was terrifying, but beautiful, Rocio knew. After a few days of this, Claudia's yelling and crying, Rocio went to the neighbor's house and called my grandmother Cecilia. The thin, sad-faced elderly neighbor silently handed Rocio a bag full of plums before she walked out of his front door. Thank you, Rocio whispered politely to him reaching out for them without lifting her gaze, and for the phone, for letting me use it. The sad man stared as she stumbled over her words. Two mornings later, the sun just coloring the sky red, my uncle Felix was at their bedroom door. Wake up, he repeated again and again. Wake up, as he shook their shoulders, first one, then the other two, then back again. They had only been back in Mexico City a few months when my mother gave Julia away. She disappeared, my sister. Sent her off from our family home, never to return again for more than an occasional weighty and always too short visit. She got rid of one of us, Claudia did, just like that. And then I was born, mere months after Julia was given away, born into that gaping hole that was my missing sister. This is perhaps a different immigrant story than we are used to hearing, the story of a child being given up for adoption. Yet this is the history that has written everything I do, everything I write, my sense of home, of displacement, of language, the way in which I move between things and ideas, different forms of storytelling, the flow with which I approach creativity, all of it has been written by my early displacement and the ways in which I adapted as a child, learning to make a new place my home. I live between things, move between things, and that in-betweenness in is a great source of creativity for me. Thank you.
Hi, thanks everybody for coming. I bring you a 100% authentic pollution, Mexico City pollution abetted Chilango bronchitis. But I can get through this. <laughs> Just flew up yesterday. Um, this is a book, my last book, The Interior Circuit. That was originally began what was going to be just a travel article for the New Yorker in which I was going to write about learning to drive in Mexico City, (laughs) which is terrifying to me. But because um, uh, it 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 coincided with such a a, a really critical time in my own life, um, this book and I together March through that time together. This, sort of, this book will, has a kind of rawness and closeness to me, immediacy that I don't think any other book quite has in the same way. Um, I'll just read a few little bits from it. But a glorieta is a, uh, I guess what here in New England you call a rotary, right? A roundabout. So I've been talking a bit about this. The, this Glorieta near an apartment I lived in in Colonia Condesa in Mexico City, and talking a bit about the, the lawlessness which with local drivers treat it. But then one late morning, 10 or, so, 10, or, 10, or, 10 or so years ago, the traffic, as usual at that hour, light. As I was walking across the Glorieta, Slitlal Tepetel, Sitlal Tepetel is one of those beautiful Aztec names that so many things in Mexico City have that could be so bewildering or such tongue, tie your tongue if you're not used to it. Sitlal Tepetel. Um, I noticed a dark colored Volkswagen Beetle going around and around it. Probably it was nothing more than that repeated circling that made me stop and watch. Or else maybe for a moment, I semi-consciously wondered why a taxi, because back then, most of the VW Beetles you saw in Mexico City were taxis, would be going around and around as if the driver were lost in a manner that just circling the roundabout was unlikely to solve, or couldn't find the exact address on the Glorieta that his passenger was stubbornly insisting on, or else was running up the fare on a sleeping or passed out passenger in this demented way. But I must have quickly noticed that it wasn't the taxi. Glittering on the VW's doors identified it as a driving school car. When it went past again, I saw the student driver, his instructor alongside in the passenger seat, was a silver-haired man with a mustache well into his 70s at least, dressed in white shirt, tie, and suit jacket. The student driver sat erect behind the wheel, grasping it with both hands at 10 and 2 o'clock, his posture, his protruding neck above the tie, giving an impression of elegant lankiness. My memory of his face seems vivid, except The face, I recall, exactly resembles that of Jed Clampett, the Beverly Hillsbilly Hillsbilly patriarch, though with a brown complexion. What, I wondered, had inspired this man to learn to drive at his age? His attire suggested that the driving lesson was a pretty momentous occasion for him, or maybe he was just that sort of old Mexican who never went out anywhere unless in suit and tie. I imagine the scene at his home earlier that morning when he was leaving for his lesson, an affectionate and proud send-off from his wife, or maybe an affectionately teasing or ironic one, or maybe he lived with a daughter, or maybe it was one of those inertia-defying widowerhood decisions that he would finally learn to drive, which is almost precisely what, in the summer of 212, it would be for me. July 25th would mark the fifth anniversary of my wife Aura Estrada's death. Aura died in Mexico City 
in the Angeles de Pedregal Hospital in the city south. 24 hours after severely breaking her spine while body surfing at Masunte on the Pacific coast of Oaxaca. She was 30 years old and we'd been married a month short of two years. Every year, it has seemed to me, grief changes, persisting in shape-shifting ways that as years go by, become more furtive. But as that fifth anniversary of Auda's death approached, a year that would mark a period in which I'd now been mourning Auda longer than I'd known her, the intensity of my grief was unsurprisingly resurgent, weighing on me in a new and at times even somewhat frightening way that I didn't know how to free myself from. There was maybe not much logic to this, but I felt that there was a problem or riddle I had to solve, and that somehow Mexico City or something in my relationship to the city held a solution. For example, sometimes I told myself that one logical step would be to leave the city and begin anew somewhere else, a city I'd never lived in before, one free of memories and associations without a, but also one in which I'd be able to escape my complicated role as private, but also rather public widower. But whenever I thought it over, I'd decide that leaving was an inconceivable step and that maybe the solution lay in staying and not merely staying, but going further in embracing with more force what I'd been tempted to flee. Maybe that was how to find a way to live in Mexico City without Aura. The approaching anniversary had more than a little to do with my decision that this was the summer when I was finally going to learn to drive in Mexico City. Thanks. So thank you all for reading. Um, I think what I liked the most about the, the panel that we put together for this is that there's such a broad diversity in approaches to narrative and uh, exploring place. And I think one of the things that I, after reading everyone's materials, after reading everyone's books and talking to, the, to everyone individually, there was something fascinating about how uh, their sense of place and displacement um, and really their, their identities were, were found through an absence, or they explored it through absence. Um, and, what, and so I, I just kind of wanted to, to go through and ask uh, each one of them, you know, what the process of, what the process was for uh, Emmanuel Xavier. Uh, what struck me was uh, a big part of his identity that was missing was his father. And yet he wrote, he writes beautifully about it in exploring it. Um, and what that process was like for you personally as you, as you went through and, and you discovered parts of your, yourself and your identity and your past and your place. I mean, a physical place of Puerto Rico you, you found in New York City, but also within yourself and within, within your poetry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was, for me, discovering poetry and writing was um, a form of healing. It was uh, an opportunity for me to express that pain and that displacement um, through my writing and sharing that um, with an audience. And um, it, like, for me, it was just something very like, personal and confessional. And as I started like, doing more events and more readings, I, I would have people coming up to me and telling me that they shared a similar experience or they were able to identify with what I was um, writing about and and so it made me realize that it, it was bigger than me you know writing is, is bigger than us often it's an opportunity to to reach other people out there who maybe don't have that opportunity or don't have that voice to to express that and and it, it could be universal it could be something that goes beyond like our cultures and heritage right <clears throat> and with in Francisco Frank with you the the absence was was your wife and I mean, what was striking about that is, you know, the, the goal that you set out to, to explore Mexico City through driving lessons and through driving 
was extraordinary in, in leafing through the pages of the Red Guide. But you know, that, that couldn't have been a natural thing. I know you were, you were wading through grief. But you know, what did you find you know, about yourself and about kind of, it seems like since that time you've actually, Mexico City is, is your place now. Um, you were born in Boston, you, you've lived in Guatemala, but Mexico City seems to have embodied who you are now. Uh, you know, it's, um, I mean, the book is a very, you know, thorough exploration of yeah. home and what the idea of home is and how, I mean, Mexico City was my home uh, before Aura yeah. died, really. Um, I've been living in Mexico City off and on since 1995. Um, even in the years when I was... Uh, uh, you know, my, my real, in some ways, university, even though I went to an American university, was as a young person in my 20s covering the wars of Central America, right, through, through, through the 80s into the early 90s, when even Mexico City was like the emerald city. It was the magic city where, well, for one thing, I could go there and get paid because there was no way for magazines to wire my payment to Guatemala City banks, you know? <laughs> It's, um, I mean, just going there after being in the, you know, horrible, impoverished, violent, racked, you know, wartime, incredibly depressing, sometimes fascinating, adrenaline-causing, you know, cities of Central America. To go to Mexico City every couple of times a year it was just, I felt so in love with it. You know? um, and I always say, I've, you know, because my family's from Guatemala on my mother's side and from the U.S. on my father's side, I always say, you know, I fell in love with the girl next door, right? I mean, I mean Mexico City. And, 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 and um, uh, but Aura's death did change everything, right? I, as I say in here, it's, it's uh, you know, when, when you read about... Um, Studies, for example, of even like the colonists of very, in the New World, colonists. You know, when did they finally say, this is my home? And it's when they bury their people there. No, that's when land starts to belong to you in a different way. And when Aura died, without a doubt, Mexico City became my home in a way, in a fiercely complicated way no place has ever been my home before no, no. Yeah. So that's you know can place be you know thinking about uh, generations you know of Americans who come here and, and I went through a process where I had to go back through and I went back and lived in Italy when my family had not uh, had been completely disassociated with it I learned the language and I studied but one of the things that I found is that place even going back there, it wasn't necessarily who I was, but was often the people that I was looking for. So when I went to Italy, I was looking for actually my mother, uh, who was not Italian. But for, with you, Veronica, I felt like place for you was you were searching, heritage, you, know, you were looking within yourself for a place which was family, which was your mother. And it seemed to have, you know, how did that ex exploration go? And how does your, your identity, you know, go back to your, your mother and your family? And, and your heritage. Well, I, I guess I should be clear. Um, yeah. I was adopted within my family by my right. uncle, who was also my godparent. So I had uh, uh, I continued a relationship with my with my family, with my sisters, right. and with my mother. This is the first time I've openly spoken about this book being loosely autobiographical, by the way. So uh, I've I've not shared this publicly before. But I had this uh, ongoing relationship with my family, but it was a, it was very distant, and so my it's why I'm a writer because I held my my family so deeply inside myself, and I was constantly making stories about the people that I was longing for, and so my my whole life has really been written by this idea of longing, and. And when I would see them, it would be a year or sometimes years later. And of course, they'd be completely different people. And my expectation that I'd be seeing these people that I had left was constantly shifting. And so for me, this idea of home or family or all of that stuff is so, there's so much uh, mobility. It moves constantly. And I think that it's the thing that's given me uh, the capacity to move between things. I've, I'm a, a, a fiction writer, but I also make films, and I 
write plays and I uh, help artists make art. And I think that my fluidity in, in my work, but also I move around a lot. And I think that that kind of fluidity, my ability to move and feel comfortable in a lot of places is very closely connected to that. Right. I want to say one other thing about, like, I just found this out actually in one of the talks that I did for Penn in yeah. New York. <clears throat> As I was talking, I realized that I move back and forth between Los Angeles and New York a lot. And every, you know, not a lot, but every six, seven years, I'm like, oh God, I have to go to LA or I have to go to New York. And now I have a child and my child moves with me. And I realized that what I'm trying to do is recreate Mexico City because <laughs> Los Angeles is one, one, you know, one part of Mexico and New York is this urban thing that Mexico City has. And the combination of Los Angeles and New York is this kind of weird, Right. internal right. vision of Mexico City that I have. Right. And since I can't, I feel like I can't move to Mexico City partially because of the air, <laughs> this is what I do. I move back and right. forth between these two right. very yeah, disparate places. Right. Yeah. And what about language? Uh, I, I, was having, I remember having a conversation with Emmanuel um, about language and that moment when you realize. I mean, one thing that I think gets, I don't know if it gets lost in these discussions about uh, immigration and, and who, what defines the United States. I know several years ago uh, there were uh, laws passed that where you would define English as, the, Amer as you know, the, the, the official language. But more and more people are, you know, people are raised bilingual. Mm -hmm. and, there, and we were having this conversation about that moment when you were a kid, and I think we were talking about Becca, the poem, and all the things that remind us of who we are, and, and, but like in glaringly. But you were talking about, interesting, about the moment that you realized that you were English was your second language. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't realize that when I was a child, I spoke Spanish at home, and that's all that I knew. It wasn't until I was in, like, I guess maybe daycare or kindergarten that I, I learned English, and I learned to speak English, and, and then I owned it. And then now I realize, like, I, I dream in English, I think in English. Like, I have to think about what I'm about to say if I'm going to speak in Spanish, like, to my family. Right. And, and, and also, in, in New York, in other cities as well, there's something, like, there's a fusion. Like, sometimes we speak Spanglish. Like, I find myself, <laughs> like, speaking in English, but they'll throw in a Spanish word or, or a word that doesn't exist in either language that's just made up, like, chequealo, which means, like, <laughs> check it out. But, check, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's just so, something that sort of like comes about, and I think it's it's I'm 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 really happy that I am bilingual, and like most other countries in the world, everybody learns like English as another language. So most of the population is bilingual; they know other languages. And it's interesting that here in the United States, you know, there was there was such a, a fight to keep everything just you know one language. Mm -hmm as you know, prominent, but I think it's important for all of us to, to, to learn a different language and, and um, you know, to understand other cultures and so right. forth. And, and you know, I see that with my little cousin now, because he, you know, I, I spoke with him in Spanish for many years because that's all he knew, and now that he's in school, he, he only speaks English, and he gets really excited when I come about because he has somebody that he can speak English with. Right. And it's, it's, it reminds me of my childhood. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, well, language captures something, and I think it, it captures the essence of who we are and all the different areas that, that make up who we are. But we were also talking about um, secrets earlier, like family secrets. And I think this is one of those things, I was reading in the Times today that there are two valedictorian uh, uh, women who graduated and they came out this morning uh, in, their, in their speeches and on Twitter saying that they were um, undocumented. But it, it made me think about the secrets that we hold and the secrets that, you know, are, that we all take for granted on a daily basis living our lives, but, but that also kind of define who we are, and, and, and they also kind of play into to our place. And so, Frank, you were talking about some of the secrets of your abuelas uh, earlier, or I don't know. I thought that was pretty, pretty fascinating. It, it, it was a cultural thing. But, it's, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, well, you know, this sounds really mean. You know, I got to see my, 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 my mother is, from Guatemala, and I don't know, she's in this assisted living place. That's a, kind of a horrible place, I think, but I 
do anything to get her back to Guatemala somehow, but it's kind of impossible. And I'll never forget going to her. I go, Mama, I was there, I was there, you know, and we didn't have a lot of money. So it's like she's surrounded by really people who can be very mean. I remember one day sitting at the, the t dining room table with her and the parent, like she was like, you know, my mom shouldn't be spending her last years with people like this, right? Like the widow of an Irish Boston cop. You know, me and my mother were, we're, we're speaking in Spanish together. She starts shouting at us, like, what are you talking about? Why can't you speak English? Why can't you, you know? And, and, and you could just tell they were really mean. You know? And one day, like my mother in, in her room has not spoken. My mother's been in this room now about eight years. And she's not spoken to her roommate in all those eight years. Wow. Because the first time, when the first time she was there, my mother was talking, my mother was always very chattery. And she was like, you know, I don't know who, and the woman said, shut up. And since then, my mother won't say a word to her. She's so proud, you know? And uh, I was just going to get this conversation with my mom. I said, like, you know, let me tell you, know, ¿Cómo puede ser con una niña del trópico? Mina tu vida en un lugar como este. How does a girl from the tropics end her life in a place like this, end up in a place like this? And she said, no sé, hijo, no sé. No? But I mean, the other thing is I just love to go and talk. I don't get to see him nearly as much as I want to because I don't live in Boston. And she has a little senility and stuff. I mean, my mother was always the most secretive person. My mother was so secretive that I just so hated that you have any family secret being known by anybody that when I wrote my first novel, which like so many first novels seems autobiographical, like I had to make a concerted effort to make the mother in the book the opposite of my mother. <laughs> so she could not say. So if my mother was very demure and very shy, like the mother in the novel was like brash and opinionated, right? And she said, why'd you do that? I said, Mom, because it's not you. It's like the opposite of you. And she said, but not everyone thinks I'm that way. <laughs> and she was like, and, and you're not going to believe what she did. She was saying, and, like, and like, we can be around here with the family, and I'll say something. And she'll go to my, and she, my uncle, she'll say, don't tell him anything. He's going to put it in a book. <laughs> and, 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 and so she like photocopied the part down the, in the little inner page where it says, um, you know, this is a work of fiction. Every character is, <laughs> right? Like, uh, uh, you know, no one's based on a real person. She photocopied it and blew it up huge and framed it and put it inside our front door. So it's like the first thing, you know. And so anyway, yeah, it's a secret. So now that she's, oh, you know, she lets secrets slip now in a way. She's like, let her guard down. Right. Yeah. You know? But there was always this, like, one secret that I find out, you know, I always said, someday she's going to, I'm going to get to the bottom of this, which, like, there's a long story, but, like, it's always been, like, my grandfather was a colonel, and on your father's side, you know, your grandfather, uh, paternal grandfather, was the son of a colonel, and, and, and who was the mother, you know, who was Abuelito's mother? Oh, uh, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he was, and then I go, your, when you put your grandmother was the daughter of a rancher, right? And who was? Her daughter. Oh, she was a very pretty woman. She was the prettiest woman in the village. But who was she? Well, we don't know. <laughs> no? And always oh, just these secrets, these secrets. And she's still stubbornly hanging on to that secret. I was trying to get it out of her yesterday. I was like, come on, mommy. You can tell me now. You must have known. You know, as a little girl, you, everyone knows who their grandmother is. Nope. No, so she's. <laughs> so. Well. You know. I have some other relatives. It was like, write to me, people turn up on Facebook and say, I am the second cousin of your mother, you know, who one of the, from, descended from one of the sons of this rancher, you know, and so she told me. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Revelations. And, and are there secrets, uh, Veronica, that, that are rare or random Yeah, to there's secrets I'm not going to share here. <laughs> but, I mean, I think I've, you know, shared a lot yeah, right, already. Right. But, uh, yeah, there, there's... I, I, what family doesn't have secrets? I mean, that's just, like, the way families are run. I think that, like, a, a secret is a powerful thing. Um, 
I think in, in, okay, in an occasion like you're talking about where people come out and say that they're undocumented, I think that, that's a secret that you, that you have to keep for, you know, right. it's, it's a way that you keep yourself Survival. safe. In, in my family, of course, there's, there's my mother is m mentally ill. There's many, many secrets in my family. Um, and I, I think kind, for, for me, writing the novel was this process of kind of um, making the stories of things that I don't know also, you know. It's a, it's, a, it's a creative act always, a novel, even when it's loosely autobiographical. It can only be a creative act. You're, in, you're, you're completing pictures all the time. Um, I, I do want to tell the story of, of something that happened to me, just moving away from this idea yeah, of secrets, because I'm not going to tell any, right. and, <laughs> and moving to this idea of identity, that one of the things that happened to me when I wrote the novel was because I, I kind of had to inhabit these voices, including uh, the voice of a, of a mentally ill woman, as, I, as I've already mentioned. Um, that, and that was a very emotional, very intense thing for me. Um, and after... I finished the novel, I saw this psychic, this really amazing psychic. He's in Los Angeles. If any of you are in Los Angeles and you're interested, find out how to contact me through Antonio and I will give you his name. He's amazing and he, the beginning of the session was me saying my name, say your name. So I say my name three times, Veronica Gonzalez, Veronica Gonzalez, Veronica Gonzalez. And then he said, is there something missing in your name? And the night before, I had been thinking, I had just finished the novel a little while before, and I had been thinking, I wonder if I should go back to my birth name before I was adopted, which is the name I use now, Veronica Gonzalez Pena. So when he asked that, I remembered, and I said, you know what, just last night, I was thinking that maybe I should go back to my birth name. And he's like, say your name. So I said my name, Veronica Gonzalez Pena, three times, and he said, oh, that's your name. So I called my publisher, I called Hetty. <laughs> And I was like, Hetty, I'm changing my name. <laughs> and he got really upset with me because he thought that the distributor, MIT, would be really angry about having to change the name. I already had a novel under Veronica Gonzalez. It's going to make everyone get really upset. And then I told him, Asher, the psychic, told me to do it. And he's seen Asher, so he said, OK. So then <laughs> my name. I've been having the same conversation. Asher. Well, well, let me. And then there's one last thing that is really. This is this is really f so strange. It's going to sound like a lie because even to me it seems like a lie. This project that I started, which Antonio mentioned, which is called Rocky Point. I bring artists and writers together to make prints, and I make films under Rocky Point. It's this production thing. You can kind of find. You can find it online. Um, Rocky Point, and it, that name is based on a street, uh, the street name of, of a house that my ex has on Long Island that I spend a lot of time on. So the address is 5000 Rocky Point Road. The first project I did was there. So I called my agent to tell him that I'd changed my name, and he said, what does that mean, Benya? And I thought about it. It means Rocky Point. It means hmm. precipice, a rocky precipice. Wow. It was so strange. Totally right. random, and right. it just felt so right. So now I'm Veronica Gonzalez Pena, <laughs> and you know why now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to open it up uh, for questions from the audience. But I, I think one thing that I, I wanted to, to talk to uh, Emmanuel about was uh, lat uh, you know, the sense of um, Latino machismo, and also being you know, one of the first openly gay New Yorican poets, which is, you know, it's a, it's a, I think that's a, a pretty amazing thing to come out, and your, your poetry really addresses that very strongly and openly. But it's also one of those things that, that it, it's, a, it's a difficult, seem, it's a, it seems like it's a very difficult thing to do uh, with, with, the back, with your background and, and growing up the way you did. And I just mm -hmm. wondered if you could talk a little bit about the, the conflicts of identity and place and how you know, the contradictions or the, some of the things that made, you know, dealing with identity in place a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think um, it's interesting because they're, they're definitely, I mean, to this day, but even more, like, when I started writing, there was a lot of machismo, like, in, um, like, Central and South America. It's just part of our, our culture, and for a lot of reasons, I mean, it's, it's, it's prominent throughout other cultures as well, but but that, that's the term that we use within the Latino community. And um, so it was very difficult for, 
for a lot of people to to come out openly um, as gay or or transgender or whatever, because there still was that machismo, and and I find that interesting because also, like, I, I thought living in the United States, you know, um, you know, we're a lot more exposed, we're a lot more open, we're a lot more um, welcoming of, of diversity and so forth, and yet, um, you know, in other like countries in South America and other countries, it's funny because like we've had like, like. Um, like female, like women leaders, right. and like this is the first time in this country that that we even have that possibility. So right. it's it's something that that um, really I struggled with for many years, and then once, well, not not not, not really, because I, I came out like when I was sixteen, and I was very very like defiant, very like you know I like I knew that the world was changing and that things needed to change. And um, ever since that, I've been fighting that battle to, to sort of like, you know, and I think the, we've come a very long way um, as far as like gay rights and transgender rights and women's rights, but we still have a long way to go right. as a country. Yeah, I agree. And we still allow ourselves to be obsessive about defining our population whether mm -hmm. it's through our sexuality or through our ethnicity or through our race, mm -hmm. it's one of those things that we insist on definitions and categories that we can mm -hmm. check off. Um, and I hate to end it on that, on that note, um, but we have another event following us. Uh, thank you all for coming. And thank you, thank you so, Veronica and Emmanuel. Thank you so much.